folks, if you're just joining us, we're speaking with a real Canadian hero. And I say that with all sincerity as he bows his head because he is so humble. And he's blushing. <laughs> Our guest today, Captain Ray Wiss. MD is an emergency medicine specialist from Sudbury, Ontario, and member of the Canadian Forces Reserve. He's got a new book out. He was uh, fans of this show will know he was here last year. He was our first guest on this show, FOB Doc. Well, he's back this year with a brand new book called A Line in the Sand: Canadians at War in Kandahar. And I've got a bit of a surprise for Ray because last year at the end of the interview, I gave Ray some beer because it was duly owed him. <laughs> this year. He feels that the media, and I agree with him wholeheartedly, has shortchanged our Canadian forces overseas. So despite having virtually every book page of his book, A Line in the Sand, tilted down, I'm going to turn the whole show over to Ray, and Ray, I want you to tell the folks the stories you want them to hear that mm -hmm. haven't been out okay. there. And I'm going to shut up. So, well... Thanks. Uh, I guess where I would want to start would be to say that, yeah, it's true that the media in, in some ways misses a lot of the, the important stuff that's going on in Afghanistan, or maybe that's, maybe that's not entirely fair. I tell you my take on it. If, if you read both of my books, you know what you get? You get what you would get if you read every single article that appears in the Globe and Mail for three years. I know this to be true because my mother does exactly that. She cuts out every single article in the Globe and Mail and every month hands them over to me. Everything that's got to do with Afghanistan and I read it all at a shot. But here's the thing. If on January 1st uh, somebody writes a story, and I'm going to give you a couple, a story, a good news story that gives context to all the bad news stories in the year, well they can't write that story again for another year. Whereas every time one of us dies, which I do want reported, I do want our dead honored and remembered, and every time we make a mistake, if we kill a civilian or if something goes wrong in Afghanistan, then, then that gets published every single time. And that the good story that gives context to all the bad ones is missed. So let me give you a couple of, of good stories that I think are important to know. You know, the all Canadians know that a bunch of Canadians have been killed in Afghanistan. And if you ask them, is it closer to 10, 100, or 1,000, they'll probably guess correctly. And it's at closer to 100. In fact, it's 152 right now. But let me give you the two numbers that give those numbers context. The first is probably the best test to judge how a country is doing. Go to the border and watch the flow. Now, there's no better way to judge what a people think of their country. Because when they don't like it, they vote with their feet and they leave. The last time I was wearing this uniform, uh, I was getting ready to fight the Russians. It was 78 to 82, the height of the Cold War. And I was getting ready to stop the Russians from crossing into West Germany, or it was then West Germany. Now, I, I'm pretty lefty myself. You know, I'm a bit of a socialist. I like to think of myself as progressive. I voted NDP in most elections I've ever voted in. But I sure didn't want to live under Soviet communism. And I was ready to fight to prevent that from happening to other people. And the reason I knew I didn't want to is because the people who were there wanted to leave. They had to build a wall with barbed wire and armed guns, to arm men with guns, to stop people from leaving. Nobody had to fight their way out of Canada. In fact, people wanted to fight to get in. So, what's the situation in Afghanistan? Well, under the incredibly brutal occupation of the Russians in the 80s, when up to a million Afghans may have been killed, and let's be clear here, this is a country the same size as Canada. A million dead in 10 years? Think of that impact, all of it violent death. Think of what that would do to our country. Well, that produced six million Afghan refugees. In the 80s, one in every two refugees on the planet was an Afghan, living mostly in squalid refugee camps in Iran and Pakistan. And they had left because that, that's what it takes to drive people away from their homes, not famine, not economic hardship, 
war. That's what pushes people away. Insecurity, terminal insecurity. Even when there's famine, like there was in Ethiopia in 84, there won't be an enormous movement of people outside the country. They'll move around a bit inside. They'll be displaced, but they won't go very far because it's their home. So what happened in the 1990s in Afghanistan to those six million people when the Taliban took over? They stayed away. And what's happened since we got rid of the Taliban in 02? Most of those folks, more than five million plus, have come back. There's no better way to judge how a country is doing. And in my first book, I, I talk about this remarkable example of this one guy I met who was working as a translator in the war zone. Uh, you know, nice guy and spoke English very well, so certainly much better than my minimal Pashto, the language of southern Afghanistan. And so we got to talk and we got to know each other fairly well. And I got to know his story, and his story was as follows. He fled the Taliban, set up a nice business in Pakistan, was the manager of quite a big enterprise, was making great money, had a big house, servants, his kids were going to a great school, and then he came back to Afghanistan. And so I asked him why. Because I was getting ready to hear a story, you know, because here he is working as an interpreter in the war zone and getting shot at, and I thought, I'm going to hear some idealistic story about, you know, he came back to support the country and to, you know, uh, freedom, democracy, blah, blah, blah. Wrong. He said, no way. He would have loved to have stayed in Pakistan the rest of his life. He had it good there. He loved his job. He loved his house. He loved his life. He was having a great time. He came back because his wife and his kids no longer had anybody to hang out with. Because everybody they knew, every Afghan they knew, had come back. Boy, that to me had the ring of truth. It really did. So that's one thing. The Afghans themselves have voted with their feet and told us that Afghanistan is a better country now than it was under the Taliban. So that's number one. So why is it a better country? Let me give you another number every single Canadian should know. Under the Taliban, there were 600,000 students in the entire country. Again, a country the same population as Canada's. In 2008, that number is now 8 million. And let's look at a better, an even better number. Only 2% of that 600,000 under the Taliban were girls. It's now 25%. Hallelujah. So we've gone from 12,000 girls getting an education in a country the size of Canada, or population of Canada, to now 2 million girls getting an education. And if you've worked a lot in the developing world, as I did before and during medical school and afterwards, it is overwhelmingly clear that it is the education of girls and women that is the most bang for your buck. That is how you drag a country out of misery you drag it out of intolerance, you drag it out of poverty, that is where you improve society. And that's what we're doing. And I really mean that's what we, can, Canada, is doing. Not only by giving security to the Afghans, but also because we just materially contribute to that. We routinely, out in the combat area, meet with the local Afghan elders, ask them how we can best support their infrastructure, support their villages. And what do they ask us over and over again? Help us with the schools. Rebuild the schools. And so we do. But it's a running battle. Because the Taliban are not stupid. Fanatical, yes, bigoted, nihilistic, sociopathic perhaps, but not stupid. And they know education will be their undoing. They, own, they know that they can't get away with what they get away with with an educated population. They fear, like extremists all across the world, they fear education. And so they attack the schools. In 07, the last year we have hard numbers for, or I have hard numbers for, uh, they burnt or blew up 130 schools. They closed another 300 by threatening the teachers. And they murdered 105 teachers and students, almost exclusively female. Just as I got to Afghanistan, my first tour, they murdered four little girls just on the edge of our area of operations for the crime of wanting to learn how to read and write. You know, when my two daughters, who are now three and five, are old enough to read about the men who would kill little girls 
for the crime of wanting to learn how to read and write. I want to be able to tell them that their daddy stood up and did what he could to stop them. You know, that's, those are the numbers that give context to everything else that's bad that you hear about. It's war. Of course it's going to be bad. Of course there's going to be ugliness on our side. We're going to make mistakes. Innocent people are going to die who shouldn't die. It's war. It's going to be like that. But you can fundamentally reduce this conflict to just that. You've got one side that's blowing up schools and murdering children. You've got one side that's building schools and teaching them. To me, that's pretty clear-cut. I know what side of that fight I want to be on. And I'm hoping my country you know, stands by me when I do so. So those are the, the really big, important numbers to know. I mean, the other thing the media seems not to do uh, a whole lot, and, and here, this is a much fairer critique. I mean, I'm sure the media maybe once or twice a year writes a story about the Afghan refugees coming back or the schools doing much better than they did under the Taliban. Uh, but what they almost never report are our victories. And, you know, I, I don't want to come across as, a, as bloodthirsty or anything, but the reality is that we are much, much better soldiers than the Taliban. We are among the best, if not the best, soldiers in the world, and certainly in Afghanistan we've proven that. Almost inevitably, when we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Taliban, mano a mano, they die, and we come away without a scratch. And for some reason, our media just doesn't report that. And I've had Canadians come up to me and, and tell me honestly that they think that all we do in Afghanistan is go down the road, blow up, die, and then do the same thing all over again a week later. And they don't get a sense of what the war involves and, and just our pure military successes. You know, the fact that we do a very good job militarily and we almost always come out on top. And I'm not sure why they don't do that. And believe me, it is not the Canadian forces limiting that. You may think, oh, maybe the, the forces, you know, feel Canadians would be squeamish about hearing about, you know, us killing people. Well, as Rick Hillier said very clearly, we are the Canadian forces. We are not like any other government department. We kill people. And I have no trouble saying that. I, I don't think the Canadian forces or the Canadian government should shy away from being honest with the Canadian people. You haven't just sent us there to die on your behalf. You've sent us there to kill in your name. And you better be very sure of what you're asking before you send the hard men and women of the Canadian forces into harm's way because you are complicit in this killing. All Canadians are. But we are... We are very good at this, but it's not the Canadian forces blocking this. I was on my first tour, the first big combat operation I was on, overwhelming Canadian victory. We killed dozens of Taliban, which is a huge victory in, in an insurgency war. It's very rare that you catch more than you know, one or two or three of them out in the open at one time. But here they decided to stand up to us, and they paid for it big time. Not one of us was so much as scratched. And even towards the end of the battle, we captured a Taliban whom we'd shot in the chest. He was brought to me. I, he was about to die. I saved his life. And as I finished stabilizing him, I look up and there's the CBC cameraman right in my face. And I'm thinking, wow, overwhelming Canadian victory. No Canadian even wounded. And now here we are taking care of this Taliban prisoner who just a few minutes ago was trying to kill us and we've saved his life and now we're getting ready to send him to Kandahar where he's going to, get, going to go to the same hospital our guys go to and get the same care. I thought it was the, the ultimate good story about the war in Afghanistan. And I looked for the next month for any report of that battle in the media and the only thing I found was sort of buried in the CBC website, there was a small slideshow uh, about this story. That was it. There was nothing else. It, and other battles that were just as significant um, had, had nothing. They just never made it into the news. Just let me interrupt you here for a sec, Ray. Folks, we're talking with Ray Weiss today. We're talking about his new book, A Line in the Sand. I also want to let you know, Ray is a combat doctor, not just a medic, an actual doctor, and he has been on the cutting edge, if you will, of emergency techniques in combat, and uh, he brought into, into combat something called ultrasound, and uh, this has revolutionized 
and saved many, many lives in the way that it has diagnosed, been able to diagnose right in a, in a combat area what is going on internally in a person. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I just wanted to orient you and let you know that we're speaking with a Canadian hero, Ray Weiss, and his book, A Line in the Sand. i got to tell you where to get the book. www.brenthollandshow.com www.brenthollandshow.com Excuse me, as always, because I'm excited here, folks. I'm talking to Ray. Uh, as always, click on the book cover. We'll take you right to a place online where you can get the book. And profits from this book, let's not forget, are going to go to Rick Hillier's... Um, What's the name of it, Ray? Mil Military Families. Thank you. Military Families Fund. Um, just like General McKenzie last year when he was on the show, you'll remember that uh, part, part of his book, uh, Profits, went there as well. And that link will be on the www.brenthollandshow.com, proudly shown there. Sorry, Ray, to interrupt you. No problems. Well, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, it's important to me that people know that I'm not making any money off of this. Um, let's see. So we've talked about the... You know, the numbers, our quality as soldiers. Do you want to talk um, about a few of the personal stories? Sure. Um, um, because the folks that have laid their lives down and been wounded, they're mm -hmm. real people. They're very and real. this is something that I think is glossed over again in our media, mm -hmm. that these folks have kids at home, they have yeah. parents, they have wives, daughters, uh, husbands. Yeah. Um, you know, on my first tour, we lost 12 soldiers. Uh, I'd left 12 orphans, you know, two of whom uh, weren't even born yet when their fathers were killed. And, uh, you know, that, that had a lot to do with why I, I initially was convinced to publish my books. I, I hadn't gone to Afghanistan to write a book, and I had just written a diary. And when that diary got around and people started encouraging me to publish it, I, I really didn't want to make money off of something when... Some of these guys hadn't come back, but uh, if I could help their families out, it, it seemed like uh, that was certainly a good thing to do. And it's since morphed a bit into also an educational project because it's clear that a lot of Canadians, uh, you know, are, just don't have a whole lot of information about this war. And yet, you know, there's nothing more momentous for a country than to send its young people into harm's way. You know, Ray, I feel like the country doesn't even realize it's at war. No, I, I think that's a I think that's a fair comment. I think uh, you know the 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 most common reaction I get, even from people who are, you know, living in big cities, well educated, and uh, you would think would be with it. Uh, the most common comment from folks who've read my books is, "I had no idea." You know, I was about to leave for my second tour, and. Uh, a doctor who works with me, you know, came up to me and said, so Afghanistan, um, we're there as peacekeepers, right? <laughs> and uh, astounding, you know, and, and every couple of weeks I get asked by a Canadian, uh, hey, I heard you were in Iraq. No, I wasn't. You know, Iraq is this, this thing that I completely oppose. It's, it's this war that, like most Canadians, I think is a combination of tragedy, crime, and farce. But uh, it has got nothing to do with what's going on in Iraq, and, or in, in Afghanistan, rather. And, and, and that brings up another point that's important. You know, a lot of Canadians are uncomfortable with Afghanistan because we're lining up with the Americans. You've certainly, the, the, the side I would usually line up with, you know, that social, progressive, NDP side that I have usually found myself on in political life, in, in social life, since I've been of voting age, certainly that a lot of those folks feel uncomfortable now that we're lined up with the Americans. Well, let me remind you of something. When we were fighting Hitler, who was our ally? Stalin. Now, it's pretty easy to make the case over the long term that Stalin was a worse mass murderer than Hitler was. And nonetheless, it was appropriate for us to ally ourselves with him because the Nazis had to be defeated. And the same would apply to our Afghan allies. You know, they're there, they got their problems. I've got my problems with them, for sure. But as Churchill said, the only thing harder than fighting a war with allies is fighting one without them. And the question we should be having is not who are we with and all these other debates we're having. The only question we should be having, the only debate we should be having here in Canada is, is this the right fight? Is this that very rare thing, a moral war? Because moral wars, if you read uh, you know, St. Augustine's 
definition of a just war is predicated on four things. And the first one is really de- the definition of the enemy. Has the enemy gone so far into immorality that it has become moral to wage war against him? And that's a very rare thing. And I think in this case, though, it fits the bill. I think the Taliban have done exactly that. And if you, if that's the debate we should be having in Canada, that's the debate we're not having. You know, we're having debates about our allies. You know, we're having a detainee issue, right? We're talking a lot about how our Afghan allies are uncomfortable to be around because they, they violate human rights. And we've absolutely got to talk about that. I'm not saying we bury that. We talk about that. We do our best to moderate our Afghan allies. Absolutely. Although, again, let's put that in context. There's no detainee issue on the Taliban side because there are no Taliban detainees. That's right. That's right. These people are all dead. Uh, a few days after I got to Afghanistan for my first tour and about two months again into my, into my first tour, on these two occasions, I was part of a group that found the bodies of Afghan soldiers and policemen who had been captured by the Taliban. And these men died within 24 hours after tortures that can only be described as medieval. And like a lot of Canadian soldiers, after seeing that and hearing about that, I carried one bullet from my pistol and one from my rifle in my right pants pocket. Because if by some incredible stroke of bad luck it looked like I was going to get captured, I wanted to have one final option. There's no way I was going to end my days like that. But um, in any case, but to, to go back to the, the whole moral war concept, you know, it, it were yes, we've got uncomfortable allies, but at least we've got allies. You know, the the other thing that at the other extreme, the ones we're not uncomfortable with are the ones who aren't there, right? The, when we were really deep in, you know, deep in it, keep this PG, but when we were deep in it in Kandahar province before the Americans came and, and took over about half of our area of operations, but you got to remember when we went into Afghanistan, into Kandahar province specifically in uh, early 06, we were taking on the toughest assignment in all of Afghanistan. The Taliban were resurgent. This is the area where they had the most support. We were taking on the toughest mission, and we did it with one thousand man battle group. You have to understand that of the three thousand Canadians who are in Afghanistan at any one time, only one thousand are the battle group, the guys who actually go out and fight. And it was a huge amount of territory for us to cover, and we did it virtually unassisted for almost four years. And during that time, we were promised an extra thousand men to come from the European part of NATO. Now, not the British, who are heavily involved in Helmand province to the west of us, and not the Dutch, who are heavily involved in Ruzgan province to the north. They are doing more than their fair share. But what about the Germans, the French, the Italians, the Spanish? We're talking, and the rest of NATO, we're talking two million men under arms. And out of that two million, they couldn't find 1,000 to come and give us a hand where the fighting is actually tough. Oh, they sent extra men, but with all kinds of caveats, right? can't fight down south, can't go out at night. The Germans have this rule that says they can't go out at night. I mean, come on, guys, you started two world wars. Surely, <laughs> surely, you, can, surely you can fight a little bit harder than that. But no, they, that's their rule. They don't go out at night. In any case, if you're uncomfortable with that, though, again, I would remind you that in the dark days of 1940, boy, we stood with the British and not very many others. You know, The Nazis had all of Western Europe. And in 1942, you could say things looked even worse. Three months into 1942, now the Nazis haven't budged. They've got most of North Africa, and now they've got, the Japanese have got half of the Pacific. And we are reeling on virtually every front. But we kept on fighting because the Japanese militarists, who were just about as bad as the Nazis, if you study your history carefully, and the Nazis, couldn't be tolerated on this planet. We had to fight these people. So again, you know, do we, that's, the, that's the test we should be applying to the Taliban. Are these people we want to fight? Because they hate our guts. They find us as abhorrent as we find them. They find our way of life revolting, just like we find theirs revolting. They've attacked us, and they will attack us again. And so, you know, that's our choice is to fight them now or not. And let's be clear about that. That's something that people often confuse themselves on is I hear this argument a lot well why Afghanistan because why not 
Darfur? Why not Liberia? Why not all these other places where bad things are happening? That doesn't make geopolitical sense. We cannot, as a country, Canada, attack Darfur and start attacking the Janjaweed militia there. It just won't happen. Geopolitically, it won't happen. We do not have what it takes to be able to do that. The where with the military wherewithal. Our choice, geopolitically, is do we participate in the Afghan mission or do we not? That's the only place where there's enough broad consensus among the countries of the world that a country like Canada can actually contribute to a mission. So the choice is not Afghanistan or something else. The choice is Afghanistan or nothing. Folks, we're hearing something very refreshing today, and that's the truth. Isn't that nice to hear for a, for a change instead of all the contrived stuff we hear usually on the mainstream media? Folks, we're speaking with Ray Weiss today, and of course he's a Canadian war hero. He is a frontline doctor. He's just got back from his second tour in Afghanistan. His, fir his first book, of course, was FOB Doc. That can be found at www.brenthollandshow.com, as with this interview as well, www.brenthollandshow.com. His new book is called A Line in the Stand. And I'm going to go as far as saying this could be the Bible that historians will refer to time and time again, because this is the true story of somebody boots on the ground, as they say, somebody that was right there, center stage, and he takes you through all kinds of stories. This is a diary in format from the day he arrives to the day he gets home here in Sudbury. And he takes you through all the things that happened, all the war porn, as I like to say, that only the mainstream media will cover. But more importantly than that, the stories that don't get told, the stories you don't know about, you are going to find in this book, the human stories. And you are going to be ever so proud of our fighting forces. Um, I can't say enough about this book. It is so well written. I particularly love the chapter called The Quiet Ones. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant, Ray. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Ray because, as I said at the outset of this show, I want folks to know what Ray wants to say. I'm not going to doctor this in any way. This is Ray's show, and I'm going to shut up and sit back down. You know, the, the other thing that I hear Canadians debating a lot is, will we win? You know, that's the other thing I hear. You know, we've, we've done our share. It looks like we're not getting anywhere. Will, can we ever win? Well, I would ask Canadians who think that way to consider two things. First off, there's all kinds of things that are hard, that take a long time to accomplish anything in life. In my 20 years in emergency medicine, I've been intimately involved in the fight against child abuse and cancer. Boy, we're nowhere near winning either one of those fights, but do we give up? Do we quit? Absolutely not. And again, let's put That's some historical... That's a great analogy, by the way. Well, let me give you another one. Let's give it some historical context. Uh, for all of my left-leaning politics, I'm very happy that Soviet communism is dead and gone. How long did it take us, how long did we have to stand up to that before it caved in like a house of cards? Forty-five years. In terms of our fight against Soviet communism, it's 1954. And we've got to wait until 1989 before the wall comes down and that thing collapses. So, you know, let's put these things into some historical context. You know, it, there are things that take a long time, but the question should be, you know, is it again the right war? And let's be clear about the Cold War. Not only did it last 45 years, but thousands of Canadians died. And I'm not talking about the, the Korean conflict where 630 Canadians actually died in combat. We made choices as a society and in today's dollars, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars confronting Soviet communism. And because we made those choices as a society, Canadians died. They died in our emergency departments. They died in our hospitals. They died in our old folks' home. They died on our streets because youth at risk didn't have the kind of care they could have. They died on our native reserves. They died in our alcohol treatment programs. But they died because we put resources in one place confronting Soviet communism and we didn't put them somewhere else. 
we made those choices as, as a society, and Canadians died. They didn't die in a sexy way that gets you reported on the news by blowing up in an armored vehicle in Afghanistan. But Canadians died, and we lost people. I think it's a, you know, it's it's facetious. It's a, it's a, you know, it's it's philosophically dishonest to say that we didn't lose anybody fighting the Russians. We did. We lost thousands of Canadians because of the choices we made as a society. And so, if you wonder if we're going to win finally, I would ask you to come back to my original premise. If this really is a moral war, then it's one we're going to win for the same reason fundamental reason that we won against the Nazis and that we won against the communists. War, moral wars are wars of ideas. Can I just interrupt you there? Often I'll get thrown in my face. Mm -hmm. This is just Canada being uh, colonialism mm -hmm. uh, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we have no right to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just more European colonialism mm -hmm. and Afghan for the Afghans and the heck with it. Okay. What's your response to something like that? I sure would, yeah. So the, the, I'll just finish my, my last thought. Though. If this is a war of ideas, our ideas are fundamentally more appealing to human beings. Mm. And you want the proof for that. People want Afghanistan for the Afghans. You know, one question I always ask Canadians who are debating this with me is, are there any Afghans on our side who are fighting for us? And people will answer, yes, no, maybe. And then the ones who say, well, yeah, I think there are, then I'll ask, okay, who's getting killed more often, them or us? You know, the one, the Afghans were on our side or the Canadian soldiers? And then if they get that right, that it's the Afghans, I'll ask them, well, okay, by a factor of what? Like, are there twice as many Afghan soldiers getting killed as Canadians? Three times, four times? Well, the answer is 20 times. This is an Afghan civil war. Right? We are not there as colonialists. We are there fighting one, helping one side in a civil war fight against the other side. It is the Afghans themselves who are doing by far the lion's share of the fighting and the wounding and the dying. They are the ones getting hurt. They are the ones getting killed. All right? to, you know, we are there to help train them. And you, know, you can say a lot of non-complimentary things about the Afghan army. You know. Uh, the literacy rate is poor. You know, the competence is, well, it's actually coming along pretty well, but it's still not Canadian standards. You know, there's a bit of corruption in the army, nowhere near as much as there is in the police, uh, but, uh, and actually nowhere near as much as in any other branch of government. The army is probably the most respected and cleanest branch of the Afghan government. But one thing you cannot fault the Afghan army on is its courage. You know, you talk to anybody who served with the Afghans, and they may think, boy, they're not that literate, they, they don't understand the world that well, and they don't, you know, they may be not that competent, but, boy, they have got a hate on for the Taliban. They are looking for some serious payback. You know, we talk about the human rights abuses of the Taliban in abstract form. To them, it's not abstract. They lived it. And you talk to some of these guys, and they will relate the murder of entire families. You know, so to say that we're there as colonialists, when you've seen Afghan soldiers go down mined roads that we go down in armored vehicles, and they go down them in Ford Ranger pickup trucks, knowing full well that if they hit a mine, it's not people are going to get shaken around, maybe like our guys are. You know, I know guys have blown up three, four, five times in our armored vehicles, and all they've got is a bit of ringing in their ears. These Ford Rangers, they hit a mine, everybody's dead or mutilated, and they keep going down these roads every single day because, again, they do not want the Taliban coming back, not in their former incarnation, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead. Can we talk about Monsieur Bedar? Hmm. Because, uh, uh -huh. Mr. Bedar, because he's somebody that you come back to all the time in the book, mm -hmm. and I feel his story needs to be told, and, and uh, I think it's a story that hasn't been told. Uh, 
again, coming back to that individual story that hasn't been told, but yet a story that is so important to the mosaic of what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. um, you mean David Art? Yes. If there's someone else you want to mm -hmm. talk about, or many people you want to talk about, no, David, has, no, Dave Bedard is a uh, is a Sudbury policeman. Mm -hmm. He is uh, retired now. He served as a policeman in Sudbury for 30 years before retiring, and we got to know each other through that because I was the doctor for the tactical unit, the SWAT team of our local police department. And Dave deployed to Afghanistan uh, to assist the police as a trainer uh, just a bit before I went. And we ended up serving at the same time in Afghanistan. He came back a little bit after I came back. And then he went back for a second tour. Uh, so I served two full years in Afghanistan. And, you know, to me this is Obviously, the, the level of engagement of a, of a Canadian is extraordinary. I mean, this guy is a hero. You know, this guy's taken a lot more chances than I have and, you know, has probably done a lot more good because, you know, what I've been involved in is, you know, body repair, but he's been involved in education. But in Ray, you the word. Waves, don't cut yourself short. No, but, to, but yeah, you know, I, I he's, he's going to change, himself. he's going to change what's going on in Afghanistan because he's teaching the Afghan police you know to be more competent to be less corrupt to be more efficient so that they can defeat the Taliban on the ground for sure but also so that they can be better for their own people and that is really what's going to win this war is that kind of education at all levels is what's going to win this war and Dave is a, a superb superb teacher in that respect, you know, he's he's everything you want a teacher to be. You know, he's calm and he's patient and he's got this universe of experience. You know, this mountain of experience to draw on, and and it's extraordinary how how much of it transfers over. I mean, a lot of stuff is cultural and it's situational and it's local, but it is extraordinary to see the degree to which this stuff carries over and how well a guy like Dave Bedard can read somebody in a heartbeat. Doesn't matter if he's, you know, a unilingual Pashtun Afghan. Uh, Dave Bedard can size him up pretty quickly. And it's it's interesting to watch that actually happen. And uh, having him walk into a room and say, yeah, those two guys are drug addicts. I'm like, Dave, you know, I'm a doctor. In fact, I'm a doctor who studied toxicology. You know, I've got a mini, f I'm part of a fellowship in toxicology. And I know overdoses. I'm, I'm the one who teaches that here in Sudbury to our, our medical and emergency medicine trainees. And he can pick them out better than I can. Just like that. Oh, yeah. It's something to watch. And, yeah, he just he understands human nature. He really does. Folks, we're speaking with Ray Wees today. We're talking about his new book, A Line in the Sand. Easy way to get it, as always, www.brenthollandshow.com. Just click on the book cover. We'll take you somewhere right online. Um, Ray, I'm going to go down a road that if you want to back up, that's fine. It's no problem. But I want to talk about a fellow by the name of Andrew. And um, what's Wendy's last name? Because I'm blanking on Wendy's last name right now. Andrew's last name. You uh, Miller, sorry. No, thank sorry, you. Wendy Miller. Oh. And I apologize profoundly for that. Folks, I was down at the end of June in Salt Lake City. And I was there for a conference, and um, the paper came around, and on the front page it said, Canadian soldier dead. And then it said, tragically, he was killed um, because an IED went off. Ah, oh, jeez, you know. And then I read on, and it said, yeah, he was a medic, and he was from Sudbury, Ontario. Now, let me just go back a bit with the arc. I've been in Sudbury for three years. When we first got here, because I'm a short little fat guy, I went to a big and tall raise laughing, but it's true. Our first friend we ever met here, Wendy Miller, the mother of Andrew Miller. Andrew Miller was killed that day by an IED, and uh, he was the 150th Canadian soldier killed. There are now 152. <clears throat> and... We were still in Salt Lake City, so I couldn't make it 
to this service. And I'm going to turn it over to Ray right now. Thank you. Hmm. <sighs> yeah. Of the 152 Canadians killed in Afghanistan, eight of them have been medics. Uh, very high uh, rate of loss because they we're quite a small group. The medics who serve out in the uh, in the combat area, there are uh, only about a dozen or 15 of us who serve as you know medical personnel in the combat zone. And Andrew was one of those guys. Um, he had been responding to an earlier mine attack when his vehicle was hit. You know, you think about that, right? He just... Bomb's gone off. You know, the bad guys set it off. And, you know, if anybody tells you that, you probably start running and you keep running until next Tuesday in the other direction. And Andrew's job was to run towards it. And so he did. He ran towards the point of maximum danger. And there had been a report that there had been another bomb planted near a village where there were civilians. And they were going out to try to neutralize it. And uh, on the way to that, a third bomb that we had been obviously unaware of uh, was struck by the vehicle. And Andrew and his crew commander, uh, herself also a medic, uh, were both killed instantly. Andrew was the son of uh, two very good friends of mine. Uh, Ray is actually uh, also a cop, the father Ray. He's also a police officer. And he was in Afghanistan at the same time Dave Bedard and I were uh, for our first tour. So he came back and his son, his oldest son, wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. Uh, Ray's mother is Wendy, who we've heard about already. Or sorry, uh, Andrew's mother is Wendy, who we've heard about already. So, for obvious reasons, you know, just the closeness of Andrew to, my, to me personally, and the fact that he was a medic. Uh, this was a tough one, a tough one to take. Uh, you know, you go into, I do, sorry. I go into doctor mode when these kinds of things happen, obviously. I'm more concerned about the people that I'm with. And uh, the same thing would happen in Afghanistan, where one of us would be killed, and I would immediately go into doctor mode and just want to, talk to people and see how they were doing, ground them out. But um, the result of that is that I had a lot of stuff bottled up inside me. and It didn't come out until I was out of Afghanistan and into the, the Middle Eastern area where they send us to decompress, as they say, when you've been in combat for too long. And uh, it wasn't until I got there that it, it really hit me like a ton of bricks and uh, went to a pretty dark place there. Yeah, losing Andrew, you know, was... Uh, that was hard. You know, the... <laughs> the... Uh, you know, the worst part of it is that, that I'd had Ray and Wendy over for dinner the night before he was killed. And uh, Dave and his wife, Donna, and Ray and Wendy and my wife, Claude, and I had this fantastic night swimming by the lake and uh, coming in for barbecue and laughing and talking late into the night. And uh, about 11 o'clock the next morning, he was killed. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, 
you know, once again, I, I went into doctor mode, you know, to look after Ray and Wendy. You know. And I probably haven't really fully processed that part of my grief yet. But uh, I tell you, after my second tour, I uh, really understand those veterans, the ones who uh, cry about their D-Day fallen more than 80 years later. Yeah. I understand those men now completely. And, uh, and I know I'll be like them for the rest of my life. I know I will mourn my friends for the rest of my life. The most I can hope for is to make friends with these ghosts I now have. I have, uh, you know, you know what it is when you lose somebody like that is that it hurts so much. The scary thing is that you don't really know how much further the pain's going to go. It's already beyond any limit you thought you could reach, and now you've gone beyond it. So, yeah. So yeah, so you just the, the the trick is getting used to that that extreme of pain and and making friends with it, and then it doesn't seem quite so scary. It hurts just as much, but but you've been there before, and so you can deal with it. Folks, if you're lined up at a Tim Hortons right now, and you want to know the true price of that coffee, just ask Wendy Miller how much that freedom costs. I think it's as simple as that. I want to thank Ray for coming on the show, but Ray, I want to, one more question for you. Folks, uh, just to let you know, we've been speaking with Ray Weiss, his book, A Line in the Sand, www.brenthollandshow.com. Click on the book cover, we'll take you right to a place where you can get it. All the proceeds from the sale of this book go to Rick Hillier's uh, Military Families Fund. And uh, of course, that link will be right there on the Brent Holland Show proudly proudly displayed brenthollandshow.com final question Ray if you don't mind you are virtually at a podium right now so imagine yourself speaking with every university student across the country and international as this show is on the internet as well what would you say to them I would tell them to do one of three things. If you support the mission, then do so openly. Don't be shy about that. and Make people understand that you don't support just the troops, because pretty much everybody supports us, the troops. Make it clear that you support the mission. If you're not sure about the mission, then read everything you can. Our country is at war, and those of us in uniform are your brothers and sisters. We are dying on your behalf, and just as significantly, we are killing in your name. And we are the ones who will bear the scars of these events on our bodies and on our souls for the rest of our lives. Canadians owe it to us to be well informed. And finally, if after learning everything you can about the mission, you decide that you still oppose it, debate it with those of us who support it. A vigorous debate is what makes democracy thrive. And we need passion on both sides of these very important issues if our country is to make the best decisions. So speak up, debate. You know, that's the only thing I think is, well, the only thing, that's what I think is lacking from our approach in Afghanistan right now. We are not having that national debate right now. And we need to. Ladies and gentlemen, a real Canadian hero. And I say that with all sincerity, Ray Weiss. Thank you so much, my friend, and thank you so much, and to your family, for going over there and doing what you've done, and everybody else that's been over there as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it a lot. Thank God you for helping me tell our stories. Thank you.